Good evening, dear students. Welcome to another rapid session live of chemistry. Today, we are going to have a quick recap of the physical chemistry unit, which comprises three chapters. I believe yesterday you all had a wonderful session of four chapters of organic chemistry and you all are very confident about those four. Now we are going ahead with the discussion of three important physical chemistry chapters namely solutions, electrochemistry and chemical kinetics. As you know these three chapters have a marked distribution as per what you can see on the screen. You can see that electrochemistry it carries nine marks. It is one of the highest weighted chapters in 12th chemistry board exam followed by chemical kinetics and solutions which are of seven marks. Now before we go to the session let me just give you a quick insight of the trend analysis of the chapters were how the questions were asked from 2010 to 2022 what was the major areas that were covered from these three chapters this will help you to take a quick recap of those selected topics which will help your last minute revision very easy coming to the chapter solutions as you can see here from the chapter solutions we have the following topics types of solutions expressing the concentration solubility vapor pressure ideal and non-ideal solutions colligative properties and abnormal molar mass this is the list of all the topics from that chapter now if you look into this trend graph you can see that topic 2.6 has the highest number of questions asked in the past 12 years so what is topic 2.6 colligative properties and determination of molar mass from this particular area lot many questions have been asked so this is the area that you need to focus and work in the last minute now going to the next topic or the next chapter electrochemistry in again coming to electrochemistry you can see that the maximum weightage of questions came from Nernst equation. So this is the topic that you need to focus more in the last minute. And then few of the short answer questions were asked from conductance related topic of electrolytes, which is again a very important topic where you have a lot of formulas to remember and all of you need to do a quick recap of those formulas. From the next chapter, which is chemical kinetics, you can see chemical kinetics is having lot of numerical questions asked every year and topic 4.3, which is integrated rate equation. This is where most number of questions were asked in the past 10 years. So I request all of you to please have a quick recap in the last minute about the formulas, the graphs, and the, the, the repeated number of questions which were asked in the previous board exams. So without wasting much time, let's go to each chapter and discuss few of the brief points related to the topics and look at some of the most important questions related to those topics. I believe I'm audible to everyone. If yes, please comment in the comment box. Right. So first we are going to have a quick recap of the chapter solutions. We will go through the most important topics and the formulas that you need to remember while solving the questions from this chapter. As I said, you, you may get theory questions from this as well as numerical questions. And when it comes to numerical, focus mainly on Raoult's law and then towards the end, we have colligative properties and abnormal molar mass. These are the areas from which we are expecting more number of questions. So starting with the first part of the chapter, 
we have different methods of expressing the concentration as you all know in the chapter solutions you have only two terms solutions are binary mixtures where one component is dissolved in another component the dissolved component is called as the solute and the component which is present in bulk where you dissolve the substance is called as the solvent so there are different ways of expressing how much solute is present in a given amount of solvent so i believe all of you remember this formula first one is mass percentage much numericals are not asked from this section but i'll just have a quick recap of this formula mass percentage of any substance can be expressed as the weight of the substance in grams divided by the total weight of the solution so weight of the substance means here we have the weight of the solute or the amount of the solute dissolved divided by the total weight of the solution which is the combined weight of the solute plus the solvent into 100 this is what is called as mass percentage now similarly we have mass by volume percentage where the only difference is instead of dividing by the total mass of the solution we take the volume of the solution multiplied with 100 then we have volume percentage where both are liquids the solute as well as the solvent are liquid so in that case we take the volume of the solute divided by the volume of the solution i wouldn't ask you to focus much on these three because these are very basic and you won't get much number of questions from this now the next one is parts per million or ppm so here this particular concentration term is used when the concentration of the substance or the solute is negligibly small in the solution especially you know when we have some pesticides etc dissolved in a large amount of water like you know the amount expressing the amount of ddt present in water we use the term parts per million as well as parts per billion so parts per million is expressed as the weight of the dissolved substance divided by the total weight of the solution multiplied with a million that is 10 raised to 6 this is how you convert any concentration term into parts per million if it is parts per billion we multiply it with 10 raised to 9 now the next parameter is mole fraction so in mole fraction this is one of the most important uh, parameter or concentration term that you need to remember mole fraction of any substance in a solution is defined as the ratio of number of moles of that substance divided by the total number of moles in the solution for example if i have a component called a and a component called b and if i have to express the mole fraction of component a i can write it as number of moles of a divided by number of moles of a plus number of moles of b similarly mole fraction of b can be expressed as number of moles of b divided by number of moles of a plus number of moles of b and you must remember that in a binary mixture where there are two components if you add the mole fraction you can see xa plus xb what will be xa plus xb na by na plus nb and nb by na plus nb so if you add this you will get one so this is a very very important concept to remember sum of mole fractions of a binary mixture will be always one so in some questions if they give you mole fraction of one component you can find the other mole fraction by just subtracting it from one and just a quick recap everybody know what is the meaning of number of moles number of moles of any substance can be found out by dividing the weight of that substance by its molecular mass right now the next parameter the next two concentration terms are the most important concentration terms one is molality and the other one is molarity so what is the meaning of molality molality is simply defined as the number of moles of solute per kilogram of the solvent the number of moles of solute per kilogram of the solvent this is very important whereas molarity is the number of moles of the solute per liter of the solution so all of you must remember this difference clearly molality which is expressed as small m can be written as 
number of moles of the solute say for example i am taking a solution where a is the solvent and b is the solute so in this case number of moles of solute divided by the weight of the solvent in kilogram this is the expression for molality whereas molarity is number of moles of the solute divided by volume of the solution in liters in liters yes vignesh what does 10 percentage by mass mean see 10 percentage it's a it's a way of expressing the mass percentage 10 percentage of any substance means 10 gram of that substance is present in 90 gram of the solvent simple see say for example in your textbook there is an example of 35 percentage ethylene glycol what is the meaning of that 35 gram of ethylene glycol is dissolved in 100 ml of solution or 100 gram of solution so the amount of the solute is 35 whereas that of the solvent is 65 and what is the importance of ethylene glycol can anyone say what is the importance of ethylene glycol yes ethylene glycol is used as an antifreeze because if you add ethylene glycol it will lower the freezing point or the melting point so what will happen is water will freeze at a much lower temperature so this is useful especially in countries where there is very cold climate so that you know the water which is used as a, as a coolant in the radiator will not freeze right so molality and molarity these are the differences and let me ask you one more thing why is molality preferred over molarity this was asked quite a couple of times in board exam as a reasoning question why do we use molality more than molarity or which one is temperature dependent as you can see clearly in this case of molarity there is an expression in the denominator which is volume 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 can change with temperature as a result if you prepare a solution and keep it marked as some molar solution if the surrounding temperature is different so it will change the value of the molarity that's why molarity is not much preferred compared to molality hope those points are clear to everyone so those are the concentration terms now coming to some of the important laws related to solutions first we have the henry's law which is a very basic uh, law related to the solubility of a gas in a liquid this is a very very important area where you can expect theory based questions as well as numericals but you know mostly as per the trend it is theory based questions that is asked from henry's law so what does henry's law suggest according to henry's law partial pressure of a gas above a liquid is directly proportional to the mole fraction of the gas in the solution which means the more pressure you hold for a gas above a liquid the more is the solubility of that gas in the liquid and this has wide range of applications this has so many uses one simple example is the soda bottle the carbonated drinks when we keep the pressure of carbon dioxide very high above water the chance of carbon dioxide to get solubilized in water is very high right now about this formula i need to tell you few important things first one partial pressure is equal to kh into x so here partial pressure by x or the mole fraction is equal to kh right kh is called as henry's constant and it is a constant for a given gas at a given temperature now if you hold the pressure constant we can see that kh is inversely proportional to x yes or no kh is inversely proportional to x so what is basically x x is the mole fraction which is a way of expressing how much is the solubility of a gas more the mole fraction more is the solubility now here we can come into a conclusion kh is inversely proportional to solubility what is the meaning of that 
if a gas has a higher value of kh its solubility is going to be lesser and vice versa if a gas has a lower value of kh it is more soluble so everybody need to remember this relationship and also kh is directly related to the temperature higher the temperature more is the value of kh or in another way we can relate temperature and solubility what will happen if you raise the temperature of a gas its solubility in water or any solvent for that matter will decrease so this particular relationship is very 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 important everybody need to remember this temperature is directly proportional to kh which is inversely proportional to solubility of the gas hope that point is clear yes p is the partial pressure p is the partial pressure kh is henry's constant and x is mole fraction right so here you can see application of this uh, in so many places for example if you consider the solubility of the gases and their kh value see if you if you take a noble gas like helium its solubility is very less compared to gases like oxygen and nitrogen so uh, I, I i i could see that uh, yeah, can you explain what bends is? Yeah, see, in case of scuba diving, instead of carrying a cylinder, air cylinder which contain only oxygen and hydrogen mixture, they carry oxygen, nitrogen and helium mixture. They increase the proportion of helium. Why? Why is it so? Because for deep sea diving, when they go to uh, the, the, the bottom of the ocean, what will happen is the solubility of the gas will increase. So if this gases gets into the blood, the solubility when it increases, when you come back, these gases will be uh, released from the blood and that will cause the generation of bubbles of gases which creates a condition called bends. So that is a lethal condition. So in order to avoid bends, what we do is we put helium gas in the scuba diving apparatus for breathing. Is that clear to everyone? Right. So I believe I have explained to you almost all the important points related to uh, Henry's constant. And when questions come, I will explain uh, the relevant theory related to that. Now, the next law that we need to focus is Raoult's law. Very, very important law. Raoult's law. See, in case of Raoult's law, what does it say? Partial pressure of a component is equal to the partial pressure of the pure component into the mole fraction. Which means, if you have a mixture where there are two components, let's call component 1 and component 2. If you take component 1 alone, how much is the partial pressure of it? That is called as P01. If you take component 2 alone, then how much is its partial pressure is called as P02. And you know that when we add any solute into a solvent or when we mix two substances, their individual partial pressures will not be as high as how they were taken alone. Because there will be molecules in between and they, they will not let the molecules to vaporize as much as they were free. So here, this P01 or P01 and P02, this term is clear for everyone. This is the partial pressures of the pure components. When we mix two components and make a solution, then in that solution, there will be some vapors of component 1, there will be some vapors of component 2. They will have individual partial pressures, right? These are called P1 and P2. Now, what does Raoult's law say? According to Raoult's law, P1 is equal to P01 into X1 and P2 is equal to P02 into X2. This is what is Raoult's law for binary solutions like liquid-liquid solutions where both the components are volatile. So I hope that point is clear to everyone. Yes, partial pressure is directly proportional to the mole fraction for a system of volatile liquids. Yes, very good Dhruvil. That is the statement for Raoult's law. Now, we have another important law related to that solutions again. The, the, the Dalton's law of partial pressure. What does it say? When you have a mixture of vapors present in above a solution, the total pressure of that mixture is equal to the sum of partial pressures of the individual components. For example, if there are two components above a solution, one and two, 
they have respectively P1 and P2 as the partial pressures, then the total pressure is equal to P1 plus P2. That is what is Dalton's law of partial pressure. See, this is mostly uh, used in case where the, you have some questions uh, where you mix two solutions and they will ask you to find the mole fraction of the components in the solution as well as mole fraction of the components in the vapor phase. There are such numericals, but you know, as per the previous trends, such a lengthy numericals are not asked these years. But you know, I, I would recommend you to go through that numerical in the textbook where you have a question uh, solved where chloroform and carbon tetrachloride is mixed. So please have a look at it where we apply the Dalton's law of partial pressure. Right. Now the last one is again Raoult's law where one component is volatile whereas the other component is non-volatile. For example, solid liquid solution. Let's say you are adding sodium chloride into water. When you add sodium chloride into water, what will happen? You know, when water is taken alone, water can vaporize easily. So vapors of water will be above the surface of water and that vapor pressure is called as the vapor pressure of pure water. Now, on top of that, if you add some solutes, on top of that, if you add some solutes, what will happen? These solutes will occupy some of the surface, which will block the water vapors from escaping. So what will happen? The, the pressure of the water will not be as much as how pure water was. Yes or no? So there will be definitely a lowering of pressure of water. So let's say our original pressure of pure water is P0W and after adding a solute it has become PW. So P0W is the pure vapor pressure of water, PW is the vapor pressure of water mixed along with a solute. Now according to Raoult's law it says there will be a lowering in vapor pressure when you add a solute. So how do you calculate the lowering? Simply subtract Yes or no? Simply subtract the pure water's vapor pressure minus what is the vapor pressure of water in salt solution. This term is called as lowering. All of you pay attention. This term is called as lowering of vapor pressure. Now, if I divide this with P0W, so what I am doing? I am comparing the lowering with respect to the pure water's vapor pressure. This whole term that I have written here, all of you can see this, this whole term what I have written here is read as relative lowering, relative lowering of vapor pressure. And remember that relative lowering of vapor pressure is a colligative property. What is the meaning of colligative property? It's a property that depends on the number of moles of solute, but not depending on the nature of the solute. That is called as colligative property. So this is one of the colligative property that we have in the syllabus, relative lowering of vapor pressure. I hope it is clear to everyone. Right, very good. Now, Raoult's law and the graph. Again, a very, very important section in solutions chapter. There are two types of solutions based on Raoult's law. Some solutions will obey Raoult's law for a given a range of concentration and temperature. And what are they called? They are called ideal solutions. But some solutions show some variation from ideality. And those are called as non-ideal solution. And many, uh, this is one area where I expect a reasoning type of question. Definitely you may have an assertion reason question related to Raoult's law and the variation from Raoult's law. So please make the concept, the theory behind it very clear. So once again, what are ideal solutions? Ideal solutions are those which obey Raoult's law. In order to know what is uh, in order to know that we need to know what is ideality or what is Raoult's law. According to Raoult's law, P A is equal to P zero A into X A, and P B is equal to P zero B into X B, and P A plus P B is what is called as total vapor pressure as uh, as per the Dalton's law. So if any solution is obeying this, then such solutions are called as ideal solutions. And you know who all will obey this? There is a condition, there is a criteria that is very important. 
what is that criteria solute solute interaction and solvent solvent interaction that means we, if you take a solute and whatever intermolecular forces they had and if you take a solvent alone and whatever intermolecular forces they have these intermolecular forces the strength of the forces must be approximately equal to the interactive forces between solute and solvent this solution is called as an ideal solution so once again all of you please focus on the slide the a b interaction should be approximately equal to a a and b b interaction which means when you mix the two solutions you will not see any variation you will not see much difference this is called as ideal solution and what are the features characteristic features of ideal solution enthalpy of mixing will be zero what is enthalpy of mixing the amount of energy or the energy change that is accompanied when you mix two solution um, two substances that is called enthalpy change see if the interactions are of the same strength there is no energy involved there so the energy change is zero so enthalpy change of mixing should be zero volume of mixing should be zero delta v should be zero and entropy change will also be zero these are the characteristic features of ideal solutions and dear students please remember the examples of solutions which behave ideally it's very easy they should be they should be very close molecules like you know structurally not much different look at this benzene and toluene benzene and toluene they differ only in a ch2 group this is benzene and this is toluene so when you mix these two you get a nearly ideal solution similarly n hexane and n heptane these are also examples for ideal solutions so everybody understood what is the meaning uh, uh, alan joseph is asking will they ask examples of both ideal and non ideal yes alan it's it's a very 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 important topic so don't skip that please do learn examples we you will understand when we do the questions related to that now whoever vary from this is called as non ideal solutions so non ideal solutions are of two types those which show positive deviation those which show negative deviation now what is the meaning of positive deviation and negative deviation think like this if you look at the graph of raoul's law see here this is the partial pressure of component b this is the partial pressure of component a this is the partial pressure the total pressure of the mixture now in a positive deviation what will happen is the pressures that we calculated will be more or the pressures that we observe for those mix mixings will be more than what is expected see here look at the shape of the graph here the total pressure is more than what is predicted the partial pressure of a is more than predicted the partial pressure of b is more than predicted what what is the immediate conclusion from this it's it's a it's a very easy concept you can you can imagine it like this the pressures are more than expected why is it more because more people are coming to the vapor phase why did more people come to the vapor phase because they are not feeling that interactive forces as much as they were in the free state so what is the condition for uh, positive deviation from raoul's law look at this solute solvent interaction is lesser than solute solute and solvent solvent interaction that makes sense isn't it when a solute and solute was interacting and when a solvent and solvent was interacting that was stronger but when they were mixed what happened the solute solvent interactions are weaker so what will happen more people will go to the vapor phase more people will go to the vapor phase that's the reason why we see a positive deviation and what are the features of positively deviating things delta h mix is greater than 0 delta v mix is greater than 0 see what is the meaning of enthalpy of mixing is greater than 0 it means it's a positive quantity that means it is an endothermic event yes or no why is it endothermic because instead of more bond formations bond breakages are happening so for breakage you need energy so that's why delta h is greater than 0 and delta v is greater than 0 now who all will show these deviations acetone ethanol acetone ch2 water methanol these are all examples of positive deviation so you just remember the examples and then when they ask you why water and methanol is showing positive deviation you can use this explanation 
What explanation? When water and water was interacting, there were stronger intermolecular hydrogen bonding. But when you added methanol, what happened? Methanol came in between. So when methanol come in between water, what will happen? Water cannot form strong hydrogen bonds as how it was when water was alone. I hope it is clear to everyone. Excellent. Now, the next deviation is called as negative deviation. So, as I said, non-ideal solutions have two variations. One is positive deviation, one is negative deviation. So, posit and neg positive deviation, the reason you understood. The exact opposite is negative deviation. Very easy. Here, the, 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 the observed pressure is lower than what is expected. Now, why would it be lower? Because there are less number of people in the vapor phase. Now, why didn't they go to the vapor phase? Because they feel comfortable in the solution itself. Because they are finding that, okay, when we got mixed, we can form bonds which are stronger than how we were alone. So, that's the reason why negative interactions come. So, all of you read along with me. Solute solvent interactions are greater than solute solvent, solute solute and solvent solvent. You see, does that make sense? If you just remember this concept and you remember the examples, you can easily explain it. Now, since solute solvent interactions are stronger, what would have happened? New bonds have been formed. Bond formations are exothermic, which means delta H mixing will be less than zero. Delta V mixing will be less than zero. Isn't it? And even entropy change will be negative. Why entropy change is negative? Because more people are confined to involve in bonding rather than, you know, letting them into the free space. Is that clear to everyone? Now, who all will form this negative deviation? Acetone and aniline, acetone and chloroform, HNO3 and water. So what you should understand from this, when you mix acetone and aniline, Acetone and aniline can form intermolecular forces which are stronger than how acetone and acetone is interacting or aniline and aniline is interacting. Is that point clear to everyone? So this is, this is the ideality and non-ideality and the deviations from non-ideal behavior. So positive deviation, negative deviation. So remember this examples. Now, azeotropes, a small concept, but definitely a possible area for assertion reason question. So what are azeotropes? Azeotropes are in, in a shorter form, we can define it as constant boiling mixtures. That means when you mix certain things and once they reach a particular composition, their composition will be same in the vapor phase as well as in the solution phase. So in such cases, it will be impossible for us to separate them by using the typical distillation methods. One example, 68% nitric acid plus water. That means, what is the meaning of 68%? I, I just told you in the beginning about mass percentage. 68 gram of nitric acid in 32 gram of water. Once nitric acid attains that composition, it's an azeotropic mixture, which means you can't further distill it to separate nitric acid or increase its concentration and similarly 95 percentage ethanol and water that is also an azeotropic mixture which means further separation of ethanol and water by distillation is not possible because in the vapor phase and the uh, solution phase they have the same composition because our our objective of distillation is that they should have different compositions in the different phases so that you know the one which will vaporize first will be coming out as vapors and then the followed by the next and we can separate them but for azeotropes it's not possible to separate because they are constant boiling mixtures and what i want you to focus here is there are two types of azeotropes one is maximum boiling and one is minimum boiling now that's very easy to remember look here people who show or mixtures who show negative deviation will be showing or will be the one which is maximum boiling see that's very easy i'll tell you how to remember that show negative deviation what is the meaning of that less number of vapors are there so less number of vapors are there means the vapor pressure is going to be lesser if vapor pressure is lesser what will happen if you try to boil this 
if you try to boil this when will boiling happen you know boiling will happen only when vapor pressure becomes equal to atmospheric pressure so if less vapors are there what will happen you will have to heat it more so that the vapor pressure will become equal to atmospheric pressure and then they boil is that clear so that's why we say that those solutions which show negative deviation are called maximum boiling as eotropes and then we have solutions which show positive deviation which are minimum boiling as eotropes so i i believe everybody understood why it is called maximum boiling why it is why the other one is called minimum boiling is that clear to everyone right now the next topic is colligative properties as i said in between colligative properties are those properties which are dependent on the number of moles of solute added but not on the nature of the solute for example the first colligative property that we have is relative lowering of vapor pressure you add any solute into a solvent like water what will happen to the vapor pressure of water the vapor pressure of water is going to decrease so this relative lowering of vapor pressure of water is independent of what the nature of the solute it is independent of the nature of the solute for example you add one molar urea into water you add one molar glucose into water the relative lowering of vapor pressure in both cases is going to be the same and one thing i want to tell you is remember this is for non electrolytes what is the meaning of non electrolytes substances that do not ionize for example urea urea if you add into water it will stay as urea itself glucose if you add into water it will stay as glucose itself but on the other hand if you add nacl into water there is a problem what is the problem nacl is going to dissociate into na plus and cl minus so if na plus and cl minus comes what will happen here i added one molar urea so i will have only one mole of solute here i have one molar glucose again i have one mole of glucose only in the solution but if i add one mole of nacl effectively i have one mole na plus and one mole cl minus so total two moles are there so for electrolytes you need to keep this in your mind and that's the whole reason why you know we had the topic called abnormal molecular mass and the correction of by van hoff's factor towards the end of the chapter right so by the way so relative lowering of vapor pressure is a colligative property so once again everybody keep it in mind what is colligative property a property that is dependent only on the quantity or the number of moles of the solute but not on the nature of the solute so relative lowering of vapor pressure is such a quantity and remember this formula as well p not 1 minus p1 by p not 1 this is called as relative lowering it is found that this relative lowering of vapor pressure is equal to mole fraction of the solute mole fraction of the solute and here we can derive a formula a very important formula what is mole fraction of solute number of moles of the solute divided by total number of moles now you see this expression in a dilute solution if you take very dilute solution number of moles of solute will be negligibly smaller compared to number of moles of the solvent number of moles of the solvent so here in the denominator factor instead of n1 plus n2 we can just write n1 that's how this equation became n2 by n1 now what is n2 number of moles of solute which is w2 by m2 and what is n1 it is w1 by m1 that's how this formula came so i hope this formula is clear to every one of you please remember this formula you may have numericals related to this and everybody understood why did we ignore the n n2 from the denominator this is for dilute solutions most of the solutions that we deal with are very dilute solutions so no need to consider the solute concentration there in the denominator factor is that clear yes sure dhruvil sure so relative lowering of vapor pressure and you know why would we need this formula because most of the times colligative properties based questions will be to calculate the molar mass of the solute you see here m2 what is m2 m2 is the molar mass of the solute is that clear 
right now the next colligative property is elevation in boiling point simple logic i told you when you add a solute the vapor pressure of the solution uh, solvent will decrease yes or no the solutions vapor pressure will be lesser than what is expected see if the vapor pressure is lesser what will happen to the boiling point definitely boiling point will increase because we will have to heat the solution more to send more and more vapors so that the vapor pressure becomes equal to atmospheric pressure yes or no so that's why we say the next colligative property is again you know dependent on the first one only right if there is a relative lowering of vapor pressure definitely there will be a increase in boiling point for the solution now that increase in boiling point can also be expressed in a mathematical formula we take that elevation in boiling point as delta tb delta tb and what is delta tb it is equal to kb into m where kb is a constant kb is a constant and remember kb is a constant for a given solvent very important it's not a universal constant it is constant for a given solvent that means water will have one value for kb benzene will have one value for kb so each solvent will have one value for kb and you don't have to buy hard the value of kb for any solvents it will be given in the question the value of kb will be given in the question now what is this delta tb elevation in boiling point that means the boiling point how much it has increased i told you that a solution will have more boiling point than the pure solvent so we can take the difference like this tb minus tb0 or tb0 what is tb0 tb0 is pure solvent's boiling point what is tb boiling point of the solvent in the solution very easy and that is equal to what kb into molality what is the expression for molality i told you it is number of moles of solute divided by weight of the solvent in kilogram now from this we can directly derive the equation delta db is equal to kb into what is number of moles wb by mb into wa most of the times the solvent's weight will be given in grams at that time you will just divide this by 1000 or this 1000 goes up so it will become into 1000 so this will be the expression that you will be using in most of the numericals question will be either to find the molar mass of the solute or you know to find the elevation in the boiling point direct substitution questions only don't worry about any uh, complications in this it will be all direct questions but there is an important thing to remember when you do the colligative properties that involves electrolytes as I told you, for electrolytes, there is a problem. What is the problem? We are assuming that you add one mole solute and one mole solute is only there in the solution. But some electrolytes will dissociate. But some electrolytes will associate. They will combine. They will dimerize, trimerize. Or, you know, some of them will dissociate to produce, you know, uh, uh, maybe uh, two moles, three moles, four moles, etc. Is that point clear to everyone? Right. So, anybody has any doubts in this formula? C, A is solvent and B is solute. Right. Now, yeah, a small add-on here. KB can be written also as what? Delta TB divided by more molality. What is the unit of delta TB? It is change in the temperature which we can take as Kelvin divided by what is molality's formula? Mole per kilogram. So, what will be the unit of Kb? Kb is equal to Kelvin mole inverse kilogram. So, just remember this unit of Kb. Is that clear to everyone? Right. Now, the next colligative property is depression in freezing point. Depression in freezing point. See, if when you add a solute into a solution i told you the low vapor pressure will be lowered boiling point will increase so definitely what will happen the freezing point will come down so this is known as depression in freezing point so here in this depression in freezing point we express the depression as delta tf that will be equal to what t0f minus tf come on just recollect what is t0f t0f is the freezing point of pure solvent which will be high and tf is freezing point of the solvent in the solution which will be lesser 
but remember for delta in case of delta tb what will we what did we take it is tb minus tb0 why because tb is bigger all of you understood that difference clearly see these are all very silly mistakes that may happen when we write the exam that's why i'm insisting on all these uh, points so please focus so t0 f minus tf this is equal to what it is equal to a constant kf into molality now what is kf kf is called as the freezing point depression constant or the cryoscopic constant now again this value is also not a universal constant its value depends on which solvent are you taking if you take water it will be 1.86 it will be given in the question if you take any other solvent the value of that particular kf value will be given in the question so same like previous i'm not going to derive it already we have the equation here for the molecular mass it is equal to kf into w2 into 1000 divided by delta tf into w1 so that is the equation which you will be using for the numerical is that clear to all yes cryoscopic constant now the last colligative property in that chapter is osmotic pressure osmotic pressure so how do we express osmotic pressure see osmotic pressure is given by pi which is equal to c into r into t this is the basic formula what is c c is the concentration what is r r is universal constant and what is t t is the absolute temperature in kelvin scale so c here is taken as molarity what is molarity number of moles per liter of the solution number of moles per liter of the solution now see there is nothing to derive here it's a ba very basic equation where we are starting here pi is equal to crt now every derivation is based on the very basic formulas that we already studied pi is equal to c c is molarity n by v into rt now what is number of moles number of moles is weight divided by molecular mass wb by mb into volume into rt now you see we got the equation for finding the molecular mass if asked so you you don't have to remember uh, all the derivations like this just remember the basic formulas like what is number of moles what is uh, osmotic pressure what is the uh, molality such basic things then instantly either you can memorize or you can derive then and there itself right now what is r r is universal gas constant remember this is an equation of pressure it's not related to energy it's not related to energy you understand the rule it's not related to energy so the value of r will be given in the question as either 0.083 bar liter per kelvin per mole or it will be given as 0.0821 atm liter per kelvin per mole these are the two values of r that you will be using in the calculation for osmotic pressure is that clear uh, it will be given see most of the constants value will be given in the question paper so you don't worry about it so that is osmotic pressure now regarding osmotic pressure more than numericals we can expect some assertion recent questions and also some questions in the mcq section especially you know related to the concentration terms you have three types of solutions based on the osmotic pressure hypertonic hypotonic isotonic again you know biology students have already learned about this in bio what are the types of solutions based on the concentration of the solute see a hypertonic solution means it has high osmotic pressure that means it has more solute and come less solvent compared to another solution remember you cannot have an absolute term called hypertonic it's a relative term what is the meaning of relative relative means you have two solutions for example i have one molar hcl and two molar hcl if i have these two solutions separated i would call two molar hcl as hyper whereas one molar hcl as hypo hypo means having less solute compared to the other is that clear so in another manner we can say it like this solute concentration is lesser here but solvent will be more whereas in hyper 
solute concentration is higher but solvent will be lesser and you all know the theory of diffusion you all know the universal phenomenon called diffusion what is diffusion diffusion is the movement of substances from higher concentration to lower concentration so you can expect that when you separate two solutions with a barrier which is made of a semi permeable membrane SPM semi permeable what will happen is you can have two possibility one is solute is more here so it can move from this side to this side but that ain't going to happen why why because a semi permeable membrane do not let the movement of solutes across it it will it will allow the movement of only solvent so this possibility is gone so now where will the movement happen solvent will move from hypo to hyper you see just by clarifying that logic that simple logic you can answer infinite number of questions related to it yes or no you don't have to always think like where will the solution move hyper to hypo or hypo to hyper solvent will always move from its higher concentration to its lower concentration where is its higher concentration in hypo where is its lower concentration in hyper now if two solutions have the same osmolarity same concentration same osmotic pressure then such solutions are called isotonic which means if you separate two solutions which are isotonic to each other and and put a semi permeable membrane nothing will happen is that point clear to everyone right now one important term is reverse osmosis reverse osmosis this is a again a theory related question you can expect it is used in desalination of water what is reverse osmosis when you apply a pressure which is more than the osmotic pressure on the solution side you can forcefully send solvent from the solution to the pure solvent see what i mean is normally normally if i have a solution here and an spm here and a pure solvent in this side what are you going to see normally solvent will move from pure solvent to solution but if you apply a pressure in this side which is greater than the osmotic pressure what will happen you can forcefully send solvent from the solution to the pure solvent side and this is what we do for uh, desalinating sea water is that concept clear see semi permeable membranes are of different types you know the normal egg membrane it's a natural semi permeable membrane then we have synthetic membranes like cellulose acetate nitrocellulose these are all semi permeable membrane and the characteristic feature of semi permeable is that they are selectively permeable they do not let everybody to cross through they let only the solvent molecules to move but not the solute i hope that is clear to everyone could you explain the shrinking of rbc yes of course uh, nitin that's that's a very very important question i told you one of the application theory based question related to osmosis is this see simple logic is this if you have a hypertonic solution and a hypotonic solution where will water move water will move from hypo to hyper say for example i have kept an rbc or a blood cell whose concentration is 0.9 percentage nacl it is equivalent to this much 0.9 percentage nacl sodium chloride now if 0.9 percentage nacl is uh, equivalent concentration is there in the rbc and i am dipping this rbc in a let's say 2 percentage nacl what will happen 2 percentage nacl means more solute is there this is hyper whereas inside of this is hypo so what will you expect you will see water will come out of the rbc this is called exosmosis exosmosis osmosis from the inside to the outside now if it was reverse like you know inside the rbc it is more concentrated and uh, outside is less concentrated what will happen endosmosis will happen so if exosmosis happen shrinking will happen to the cells this is what happens when you put fresh fruits in salt water right whereas if endosmosis take place what will happen swelling will take place so that point is clear
Yes. So once again, just I am giving a uh, briefing about reverse osmosis. In reverse osmosis, the principle is we are reversing the osmotic flow. What is a normal osmotic flow? Osmosis will happen where water will move from higher concentration to the region where there is less water. For example, I have a Na salt water and uh, pure water separated by a semi-permeable membrane. So where will water move from pure water to salt water? Correct. Now, if I have to reverse this, what should I do? I will apply an external pressure on the side of the salt water. And how much it should be? It should be more than the osmotic pressure of the salt water. If I do that, I can make water moving from salt water to pure water. So if I continuously do this, what will happen? On the salt water side, only salt will be remaining. Water is gone. This is called reverse osmosis. Hope that is clear. Right. So four important terms I have explained here which are related to the theory. Now the last part of this chapter is abnormal molar mass and Van Hoff factor. I would say it's a very 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 important concept. So all of you please uh, pay attention to these important points which I am mentioning here. Okay, This is going to help you a lot in numericals. What is Van Hoff factor? See Van Hoff factor was introduced for one reason and that is when you take an electrolyte, a solute which is an electrolyte the amount of the particles which is present in the solution will not be as compared or as predicted theoretically. For example, you put one mole NaCl in water, you are not going to see one mole NaCl. Instead, you are going to see two moles effectively. Why? Because NaCl will dissociate as Na plus and Cl minus. NaCl will dissociate as NAC, Na plus and Cl minus. So what is the problem? We are predicting the colligative property based on the number of moles. And we are doing all the calculations based on assuming that NaCl is one mole. But in reality, there will be two moles. So whatever calculation that we do for a colligative property or a molecular mass determination, it will be wrong for an electrolyte. That's the reason why we introduced a correction factor called as Van Hoff's factor. Now what is Van Hoff's factor? It can be found out by several ways. All of you please look into the formulas. Van Hoff factor is given as observed value of the colligative property divided by calculated value or calculated molecular mass divided by observed molecular mass or the easiest of all of them is just to remember this. Van Hoff factor is equal to total number of particles after association or dissociation divided by total number of moles of particles before association or dissociation. See one example. In case of NaCl, before dissociation, one mole of NaCl was taken. After dissociation, what happened? Effectively, there are two moles. So if they ask me what is the Van Hoff factor here, assuming 100% dissociation has happened. In that case, total number of moles after dissociation, how much is it? Two. Total number of moles of particles before dissociation, how much is it? One. So what is the Van Hoff factor for NaCl? It is going to be? Two. Suppose if I take calcium chloride, what will be the Van Hoff factor? It will be one calcium ion and two chloride ions. So there will be total three ions there. But you know, not all electrolytes will dissociate. Some of them will associate also. For example, benzoic acid. If you take benzoic acid, what will happen is, in case of benzoic acid, let's say you take 100 molecules of benzoic acid and put it in water. What will happen is it will dimerize. That means two benzoic acid will become one. So if you put 100, effectively in the solution, how much you have? You have only 50. So what will be the Van Hoff factor? It will be just half, 1 by 2. So for a dimer, it will be 1 by 2. Or you, you can see that how much, uh, how many molecules is it associating? That's all. Did you understand that? So that's how you find the Van Hoff factor. We will see in some numericals. Now. This Van Hoff factor has to be introduced in all of our equations of colligative properties if you are dealing with any, any solute which is an electrolyte. What is an electrolyte? Something that dissociates or associates. So for, for, uh, for dissociation's case, I will be always greater than 1. Why? Because there will be more number of particles after dissociation. For association, I will be less than 1. It is clear to everyone? 
Now, this is the formula that you all have to write down. Please remember this formula. There is something called degree of dissociation. This is the most frequently asked question related to the uh, uh, abnormal molar mass and Van Hoff factor determination. The dissociation uh, constant or we call it as alpha, the degree of dissociation can be found out by using this simple formula I minus 1 divided by N minus 1. I minus 1 divided by N minus 1. Similarly, alpha of association is 1 minus I divided by 1 minus 1 by N. See, very simple, I is Van Hoff factor, N is the number of particles. For example, in case of sodium chloride, you find out what is the value of I, which we can do using the numericals, like, you know, what, using the data what they have given, like, they will give you that this is the, this much is the observed boiling point, so how much is the degree of dissociation. So in such questions, I, you can find out, N is the number of particles it will give. For example, if it is NaCl, N will be 2. If it is uh, 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 calcium chloride, N will be 3. Like that, the value of N depends on how many particles are there after dissociation. Similarly, percentage association can be found by using this formula 1 minus I divided by 1 minus 1 by N. Please do note these two formulas. Please do note these two formulas. You will see how it, we can apply it in numericals. Yeah, the number of moles dissociated or associated. Yes, Alan, we will we will see the those questions. So this is the quick recap of the chapter solutions. Now we are directly going to the questions. And while doing questions, see since most of the questions are numericals, and I want you to uh, immediately solve the answers, and then I'll just show you how to apply this, and then you can practice. A solution of glucose in water is labeled as 10 percentage by mass. What would be the molality and molarity of the solution? Density of the solution is given as 1.2 gram per ml. See, in numericals, always follow a standardized method. Like, you know, the, the steps carry mass. You are not writing JE or NEAT, where you can take shortcuts and solve the question in, you know, less than 5 seconds or 10 seconds. In boards, Definitely steps matter. So please do write the steps like especially write down what is given You have the molar mass of Glucose glucose molar mass glucose is the solute so you can use abbreviations of your choice Like you know you can write MB or you can write M of glucose like that you can use any abbreviations you want So MB is equal to 180 gram per mole Then it is labeled as 10% what is the meaning of that? 10 gram glucose in 90 gram water 10 gram glucose in 90 gram water correct that is the meaning of 10 percentage now the question is what would be the molality so let's start with molality first molality m is equal to what is the final expression everybody remember molality's expression what is it mass of the solute divided by molar mass into weight of the solvent in gram multiplied with a thousand easy now what is the mass of the solute given they said it is 10 percent solution so you can assume that you are taking 100 gram solution so what is the mass of that glucose in that 10 gram 10 divided by what is the molar mass 180 now what is the mass of the solvent pure solvent pure solvent is how much 90 gram water right so you can take it as 90 into 1000 whatever answer you get please do write the answer with the proper unit moles per kilogram or you can also write molal or you can also write small m please don't skip units in every numerical be it physics or chemistry please have the habit of writing the units in the final answer very very important so molality calculation is clear to everyone now let's calculate molarity let's calculate molarity what is the formula for molarity capital m is equal to wb divided by mb into volume of the solution volume of the solution in ml or liter if it is ml just multiply here with thousand is that clear so what is wb 
the mass of the solute divided by what is the molar mass 180 now there is a problem we don't know the volume of the solution solutions volume is not given but that's fine you have density given correct density is given tell me what is the expression for density of a solution density of a solution is equal to mass of the solution divided by volume of the solution easy so from that you can find volume what is the expression for volume volume of the solution is equal to mass of the solution divided by density of the solution yes or no mass of the solution divided by density of the solution so i have 10 percent glucose that means i am assuming that 10 gram of glucose is there in 90 gram water so what is the total mass of the solution it's 100 gram in 100 gram the density is 1.2 gram per ml so i can what what i can take instead of volume here what was the expression i can take it as 100 divided by 1.2 the whole thing into 1000 then you will get the answer in moles per liter or you can write molar or you can write capital m is that clear to everyone everybody understood how did we find the volume from the density is it clear to all right let's move on to the next why aquatic animals are more comfortable in cold water than in warm water this is an application of henry's law think what concept do you have to apply here i told you that temperature and solubility are related temperature is inversely proportional to solubility correct so more temperature means less solubility now you have to frame it in words in warm water as the temperature is higher the solubility of dissolved oxygen will be lesser but in cold water it will be more soluble and hence animals feel more comfortable to stay in cold water than in warm water it's an application of henry's law very easy but a very important point related to the assertion recent section is that clear excellent next one gas a is more soluble in water than gas b at the same temperature which one of the two gases will have the higher value of kh come on fast again related to henry's law we just studied the application kh and temperature how is it related sorry kh and solubility how is it related it is inversely proportional it is inversely proportional what is the meaning of that more solubility lesser kh yes it is clearly said that gas a is more soluble in water than gas b at the same temperature which of the two gases will have higher value of kh who has higher value of kh higher kh means more sorry less solubility because they are inversely proportional clear so gas b will have a higher value of kh all of you got it right the next one what type of deviation is shown by a mixture of ethanol and acetone give reason see ethanol and acetone which deviation is shown see in case of ethanol ethanol and ethanol if you uh, if you take ethanol in pure state it has intermolecular hydrogen bonding you know that alcohols they have intermolecular hydrogen bonding now the moment you put acetone into that what will happen acetone will come in between ethanol molecules so the interactive forces will be weaker a b interactions will be weaker than a and a b b so what will be the kind of deviation yes very good positive deviation and they have even asked about the reason what will you write as the reason there when acetone is added to ethanol intermolecular hydrogen bonding of ethanol is disturbed hence there will be more vapors above the solution than the pure components therefore it shows positive deviation am i clear to everyone yeah delta h mix greater than zero yes 
everything is right what type of deviation is shown so just you need to mention positive deviation okay answer quickly blood cells are isotonic with 0.9 percentage sodium chloride solution what happens if we place blood cells in a solution containing 1.2 percentage sodium chloride come on fast blood cells are isotonic with 0.9 percentage sodium chloride i would ask you to remember this also blood the human blood is isotonic to 0.9 percentage saline now you are placing it in 1.2 percentage what will happen it will shrink due to exosmosis are you all able to relate the theory that we just learned which is hypertonic 1.2 percentage sodium chloride is hypertonic whereas blood cell will be hypotonic yes so water will get out of the blood cells and that causes shrinkage of the blood cells which we call as exosmosis now tell me 0.4 percentage sodium chloride solution what will happen the opposite will happen isn't it it will swell because of endosmosis due to endosmosis see of course you know depending on the marks you can always add on to the sentence or you can add more sentence there like you know the 1.2 percentage sodium chloride solution is a hypertonic solution compared to uh, blood cells therefore water will move out of the blood cells and it causes shrinkage of the blood cells like that you can add on you can write more points there right okay i can see biology terms coming up flaccid turgid yeah good swelling makes it turgid shrinking makes it flaccid Okay, next question. Quick. A solution containing 15 gram urea per liter of solution in water has the same osmotic pressure as a solution of glucose in water. Calculate the mass of glucose present in 1 liter of its solution. Okay, so here what is the hint? It says a solution containing 15 gram urea with a molecular mass 60 per liter of solution in water has the same osmotic pressure so we will take two situations osmotic pressure of urea pi urea is equal to what of that of glucose now everything is clear now what will be the equation for this urea's osmotic pressure can be written as n u by v into rt is equal to n g into rt by v yes or no again r and t is not varying because it's the same temperature at which we are treating so what will you get if two solutions have the same osmotic pressure means they have same number of moles what is the expression for number of moles of urea weight of urea by molecular mass of urea is equal to weight of glucose by molecular mass of glucose the question is calculate the mass of glucose present so mass of glucose present is wg wg is equal to what w u divided by m u into m g i am using abbreviations to make it clear like of course you you can use you know w1 w2 or uh, w a w b it's fine but you know i would recommend using this kind of abbreviation so that you know you don't get confused while you substitute the values weight of urea it said that it is 15 gram molecular mass of urea it is 60 and molecular mass of glucose it's given already 180 so we'll cancel this three so 15 threes are 45 gram this will be the weight of glucose have you all understood this clearly okay excellent let's move on to the next we have to cover electro and kinetics so i'm going a bit fast if you have doubts please ask 0.1 molar kcl has higher boiling point than 0.1 molar glucose come on fast why why is kcl 0.1 molar has a higher boiling point than 0.1 molar glucose boiling point elevation in boiling point is a colligative property you put 0.1 molar kcl in water what will happen it will ionize to form k plus and cl minus so there will be 0.1 k plus and 0.1 cl minus effectively there will be 0.2 molar whereas if you take 0.1 molar glucose is glucose an electrolyte no it's a non-electrolyte so it will not ionize so you will effectively have 0.1 molar glucose only in the solution so more the number of moles coming more will be the elevation in boiling point is that clear to everyone yes because kcl dissociates to form k plus and cl minus hence it will have more number of moles which will increase the boiling point 
it is a monosaccharide so no dissolution in water yes Dhruvil, correct now meat is preserved for a longer time by salting again a possible reasoning question you can expect meat is preserved for a longer time by salting simple logic is see how does meat get spoiled because of the growth of microorganisms on it like bacteria fungi which are acting on this uh, uh, organic matter right so if you salt meat what will happen salt is going to make that situation or make that area hypertonic do you think a living cell can survive in a hypertonic environment no because in inside a living cell it will be hypotonic compared to outside salty environment right so it will lose water and dehydrate and the cells will get destroyed that's why we have uh, the preservation out of all the preservation strategies the one of the most old school method of preservation is salting is that clear to everyone right Calculate the mass of ascorbic acid to be dissolved in 75 gram of acetic acid to lower its freezing point by 1.5 degrees Celsius. See, that's a that's again a question related to uh, the colligative property, the, the freezing point. So, coming to our equation, delta Tf is equal to Kf into molality. What is the expression for molality? Wb by Mb into wa in grams into thousand this is our basic expression right of freezing point now just look at is it an electrolyte or a non-electrolyte ascorbic acid ascorbic acid is vitamin c it's an organic compound so it's not going to uh, it's it, it, it's not an electrolyte ascorbic acid so you don't have to consider van hoff factor in this formula so delta df is equal to kf into wb by mb into wa this is the formula what do we need to find we need to find the mass of ascorbic acid which me which means you need to find wb everything is given here what all what all things are given what all things are given molar mass of the solute is given mb is given 176 to be dissolved in 75 gram that means wa is given 75 gram then what else to lower its freezing point by 1.5 degree which means delta tef is going to be 1.5 correct since it's a difference it's uh, degree or kelvin it doesn't make a difference there right then we have kf also given 3.9 right so everything is given here all you need to do is just substitute it and find the right answer do you have it out in this is this question clear to everyone see in these kind of numerical questions they might give you compounds which you have not heard of but you know don't think that it's an out of syllabus question it's a direct application level question of what theory you have learned in the textbook is that clear right calculate the boiling point elevation for a solution prepared by adding 10 gram of calcium chloride to 200 gram of water kb for water is given 0.52 kelvin kilogram per mole and molar mass is 111 see in this question one of the most common mistake that we are going to do or a silly mistake i would say will be not taking the van hoff factor you see we might forget to take the van hoff factor but you see here who is the electrolyte it's calcium chloride calcium chloride is an electrolyte which is going to dissociate to give ca2 plus and 2 cl minus so what will be the van hoff factor here it will be three so just pay attention we need to take the van hoff factor also in this problem so delta db will be equal to what i into kb into wb by mb into w a into thousand now are all things given here what all things are given they said 10 gram is added so wb is what 10 gram w a is given 200 gram kb is given 0.52 molar mass is given 111 and i is also known to us it is three so these are all known to us and we can should we change to kelvin yeah see it's a difference right vignesh so degree celsius or kelvin it's 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 a difference so it won't make a difference in the value that you are getting because you take the difference from 
10 degree to 20 degree that's a degree Celsius that same difference will be there even if you convert it into Kelvin clear so only the magnitude you need to take right so here the answer that you are getting will be <coughs> in Kelvin because this is KB for water is 0 0.52 Kelvin kilogram per mole all of you understood that right now look at the next question assuming complete dissociation calculate the expected freezing point of a solution prepared by dissolving 6 gram of global salt Na2SO4 dot 10 H2O in 0.1 kilogram of water KF4 water is given atomic masses of the elements are also given so here what are you, what are they asking is calculate the expected freezing point of a solution so here you can find delta tf and it is global salt look at the salt and tell me should i consider van hoff factor or not should i consider van hoff factor or not na2so4 dot 10h2o look Na2SO4 dot 10H2O it's going to dissociate for sure right you have sodium sulfate sodium sulfate is an ionic compound right so how will it dissociate it will dissociate as 2 Na plus 1 SO4 2 minus plus water it will stay as it is 10H2O is it clear yes so effectively you are getting three ions there did you understand that two na plus and one so4 two minus so i will be three so don't forget to take the van hoff factor especially when the solute is an electrolyte now direct substitution only there isn't much complication in this numerical everything is given here no we don't count water it's dissolved in water the ions how many effective ions is it making so kf into wb into thousand divided by mb into wa so wa into th that thousand factor you can avoid in this formula why because already you see how much is the solvents mass given 0.1 kg it's in kilogram is that clear right a solution contains 5.85 gram of NaCl per liter of solution it has an osmotic pressure of 4.75 atm at 27 degrees Celsius calculate the degree of dissociation of NaCl in this solution look at this this is the numerical where you are going to apply that degree of dissociation formula everybody please focus on this numerical it's a very important question a solution contain 5.85 gram of NaCl you know that NaCl is a electrolyte so it is definitely going to dissociate as Na plus and Cl minus and here van hoff factor you can't directly take because they are saying calculate the degree of dissociation so we it is not a hundred percent dissociation if it was hundred percent dissociation they wouldn't ask you to find the degree of dissociation so here i don't know how much is the van hoff factor what else is given the weight of the solute is given 5.85 gram the molecular mass of the solute is given 58.5 gram per mole osmotic pressure is given 4.75 atm r is given 0.082 liter atm per kelvin per mole and temperature is given 27 degrees remember always take temperature in the kelvin scale so it is 300 kelvin now they are asking us to find the degree of dissociation everybody remember the formula of degree of dissociation what was alpha dissociation formula come on i minus 1 divided by n minus 1 yes or no for dissociation it was i minus 1 divided by 
n minus 1. Now, in order to find the degree of dissociation, I need two things. What are they? First, I need n. That I know. Because when, when I put NaCl in water, there will be two moles. This is the n value. But about i, I have no idea. It is not given. But we can find i. How? How we can find i? You know, osmotic pressure expression, if you all recollect, it is equal to i into CRT. What is CRT? WB by MB into V into R into T. Correct? C means concentration, number of moles per liter into R into T. From this, I can find out what is I. Yes or no? From this, I can find out what is I. Can you quickly find out what is I by substituting these values? Already the volume is given here. It is said that it is per liter. So take it as one liter. Find the value of I. I will be pi into mb into v divided by wb into rt pi is already listed 4.75 mb is 58.5 v is 1 liter wb is 5.85 r is 0 0.082 and t is 300 Find out what is the value of I. One point nine three. Okay. One point nine three. Did did all of you got the okay, great. One point nine three. Now we are not done yet. We have found out what is I. That is the Van Hoff factor. Now, the most important part. We need to find what is the degree of dissociation. Correct? How do we find that? Alpha is equal to I minus 1 divided by N minus 1. What is I? 1.93 minus 1. What is N? 2 minus 1. So, 2 minus 1 is 1. 1.93 minus 1 is 0.93 is alpha. Or if you want to express it in percentage, it will be 0.93 into 100. How much is the degree of dissociation? 93 percentage. 93 percentage. That is the degree of dissociation. Have you all understood how to apply that I to find out the degree of dissociation or association? See, approximately 2 don't take it because if you take that, then degree of dissociation will come 100%. That will be wrong. Is it clear? It's not dissociating 100%. That's why they are asking you to find how much is the degree of dissociation. 93 percentage. Okay. Next question. The freezing point of a solution containing 5 gram of benzoic acid in 35 gram benzene is depressed by 2.94. What is the percentage association of benzoic acid if it forms a dimer in solution? Come on. Here, the only difference is, here you are using another colligative property. What is that? Delta Tf. Delta Tf is going to be I into Kf into Wb by Mb into Wa into 1000. Now, Please do write given and all those steps, okay? Since time is limiting, that's why I'm skipping that. So, delta Tf is how much? 2.94 is equal to I into Kf is 4.9, it's given. Now, Wb, Wb is 5 gram benzoic acid. So, 5 divided by molecular weight 122 into Wa dissolved in 35 gram benzene. 35 into 1000. 
find out i this is just opposite of previous question in the previous question it was to find the degree of dissociation now here we are going to find the degree of association because it's a dimerizing situation how much you got zero point five one two is this the value that everybody got right so after you get that you can directly find the alpha association what is the formula for alpha association come on quick 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 1 minus i divided by 1 minus 1 by n because in case of association it is 1 by n so that is equal to 1 minus how much is i 0 0.512 divided by 1 by 1 minus 1 by n n means here how much is forming for example for a dimer n will be 2 for a trimer n will be 3 for a tetramer n will be 4 do you understand that so it will be 1 minus 1 by 2 which is equal to alpha association is 1 minus 0.512 is how much 0 0.4 8 8 right divided by half so that will be 0 0.976 in percentage expression how much it will be 97.6 percentage 97.6 percentage is it clear see that same i minus 1 by 1 by n minus one you can take either one one minus i divided by one minus one by n right let's move on to the next question okay so those are the main questions of solutions chapter now we will have a quick recap of electrochemistry first thing writing the representation of the galvanic cell or the electrochemical cell majority of you might be knowing this already but let me give you a quick recap of the representation because that's one another silly mistake that everybody makes see you know in an electrochemical cell anode is the site where oxidation takes place and cathode is the site where reduction takes place never forget it and by convention we represent anode on the left and cathode on the right is that clear to everyone so never ever forget even in exam hall if you forget that just remember you have seen an ox on the left and a red cat on the right anode oxidation cathode reduction on the right cathode on the left anode and Anode is the negative pole because that's where uh, electrons are going to accumulate and cathode is the positive pole. And in the representation, everybody know the standard representation, the anode half is represented, then the salt bridge, then the cathode half. So just remember that, never forget it. And we can find out the E cell or the cell potential as E0 cathode minus E0 anode. Is it clear to everyone? Now, in, in this chapter, I told you Nernst equation and uh, conductance. These are the two areas where a lot of questions have been asked. So, Nernst equation for the cell potential for a given reaction, AA plus BB giving uh, XX plus YY. In that, we can write the Nernst equation as E cell is equal to E0 cell minus 2.303 RT by NF, which we can shorten as 0 0.0591 divided by n log of x raised to x into y raised to y divided by a raised to a into b raised to b basically it is product concentration divided by reactant concentration you know that if it is in an equilibrium condition e cell will be zero so e naught cell can be written as 0 0.0591 divided by n log of k 
kc what is kc kc is this equilibrium constant now there is a relationship between the cell potential and the gibbs energy change delta g not is equal to minus nf e0 cell and delta g not is equal to minus 2.303 rt log kc these for these relationships see derivations are not required here these relationships are very important because these are the only relationships which you will be using in this chapter to solve the numerical questions okay now about the conductance part there are few formulas that you need to recollect first formula everything starts from here resistance is equal to rho l by a this is where everything starts so just remember that basic formula and derive each of them separately look here what is conductance conductance is g which is inverse of resistance 1 by r then what is conductivity conductivity is kappa which is inverse of resistivity then we have molar conductivity which is lambda m which is equal to k divided by c into 1000 and one important point to remember here in this formula concentration will be given usually in moles per liter then lambda m will be expressed as siemens centimeter square mole inverse always remember that the molar conductivity the final formula is k by c into 1000 into siemens centimeter square mole inverse is that clear to everyone and here this l by a for a cell is called as the cell constant sometimes we use g star as the symbol to represent represent this right now variation of molar conductivity with the concentration the debye huckel honsager equation very important remember that see i i want everybody to put your focus on this part please see this part conductivity of a solution of an electrolyte decreases on dilution whether it is strong electrolyte or weak electrolyte conductivity conductivity means i'm talking about which parameter kappa this is going to decrease on dilution why because when you add more water the number of ions present per unit volume is decreasing the number of ions per unit volume is decreasing so conductivity will be decreasing when you dilute a solution but lambda m molar conductivity molar conductivity increases on dilution this is one of the statement that most of the time students get confused conductivity and molar conductivity variation conductivity decreases because number of unit number of ions per unit volume decreases when you add more and more water molar conductivity on the other hand increases on dilution and the reasons for that remember for a weak electrolyte when you add more solvent or when you dilute it the degree of dissociation increases hence you will see more ions coming and that will greatly shoot up the con molar conductivity of weak electrolyte because of the availability of more number of ions now uh, due to increase in degree of dissociation that's a specific reason you can highlight and then for strong electrolytes the diso the molar conductivity increases slightly but it won't be as much increase as what you see in case of weak electrolytes the reason is in strong electrolytes case even though the ions are dissociated in the solution still they will have some electrostatic attractive forces in between them so when you dilute it the forces of attraction will be lesser and they can have more freedom or mobility in the solution that's why molar conductivity increases is that clear is that clear to everyone and this debye huckel onsager equation state or its mathematical expression is lambda m is equal to lambda naught m minus a root c what is lambda m molar conductivity what is lambda naught m molar conductivity at the infinite dilution that means approximately when the concentration of the electrolyte reaches zero at that time how much is the conductivity of this electrolyte it's called as infinite molar conductivity and remember this graph this graph is very important a is a constant c is concentration look at this graph lambda m versus root c here you see the variation of weak electrolyte and strong electrolyte in case of strong electrolyte when you dilute it dilute it means i am decreasing the concentration that means i am going here look at the graph it's 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 when it is extrapolated it will go and touch here what is this point at this point the concentration is almost zero 
that means it is infinite dilution right so at that time how much is the conductivity of the electrolyte that's called as limiting molar conductivity whereas for a weak electrolyte it's not possible to extrapolate and get its value because it won't touch here so you can't extrapolate and get the value so how will you find the value of limiting molar conductivity of a weak electrolyte that's where we use call rashes low right that's where we use call rashes low is that clear to everyone is that clear to everyone right so let's see cold rashes law how we can apply that cold rashes law states that the limiting molar conductivity of an electrolyte is equal to the sum of molar conductivities limiting molar conductivities of the ions for example if i take nacl i want to find its limiting molar conductivity it will be equal to what the conductivity of na plus ion and the conductivity of cl minus ion and one thing to remember its stoichiometry also need to be considered if there are more ions for example if i write for calcium chloride molar conductivity how will i write it will be limiting molar conductivity of calcium ion plus two times limiting molar conductivity of chloride ions why because two is the stoichiometric coefficient because there are two chloride ions is that clear this is cold rashes law and what are the applications of cold rashes law you can use it for calculation of molar conductivity of weak electrolyte you can use it for calculation of degree of dissociation you can use it for calculating dissociation constant i'll just quickly brief about this please see here calculation of molar conductivity of weak electrolyte what we do here for example if i want to find out what is the molar conductivity of acetic acid i know as per cold rashes law it is the sum of the limiting conductivity of acetate ion and hydrogen ion correct so i am deriving it from another expression look at this expression molar conductivity of hcl minus ch3co na conductivity minus nacl why am i doing that because all of these are strong electrolytes and i know what is the value of limiting molar conductivity of each of them right so we add this hcl plus ch3co na and then subtract nacl from that you get the value of ch3coh is that logic clear to everyone right the second one calculation of degree of dissociation very important one expected numerical is from this section to calculate degree of dissociation limit molar conductivity of an electrolyte divided by limiting molar conductivity is equal to the degree of dissociation alpha is equal to lambda m divided by lambda not m and once you get alpha there is another thing that you can find what is that dissociation constant of an acid you see if an acid ionizes in uh, water let's say hx is ionizing to form h plus and x minus uh, initially if i take c of c concentration of hx zero and zero is the uh, concentration of h plus and x minus after some after equilibrium let's say c alpha is the amount of h plus and this is c alpha this will be c minus c alpha and writing the dissociation constant expression it will be c alpha into c alpha divided by c minus c alpha this formula is very useful because once you know the concentration value which will be given in the numerical you can find out alpha by using conductivity and then you can find the dissociation constant of the acid such kind of a numerical is also there in this section is that clear to all is it clear right next is faraday's laws of electrolysis again a portion were a small numerical you can expect there are two laws first law and the second law the first law the first law states the amount of chemical reaction occurs at any electrode during electrolysis by a current is proportional to the quantity of electricity in simple logic if you have an electrolysis happening and some substance is depositing at any electrode the mass of the substance deposited is directly proportional to the quantity of the charge that you pass m is proportional to q or you can also write m is equal to z into q or you can write m is equal to z into i into t because q is equal to i the amount of charge is equal to the current into the time taken for passing that charge now coming to what is z this is very important what is z z is called electrochemical equivalent electrochemical equivalent how do you calculate z z is equal to equivalent weight divided by the n factor 
equivalent weight divided by uh, divided by f equivalent weight by f what is f f is called faraday's constant whose value is 96500 coulombs 96500 coulombs and z z is the electrochemical equivalent and what is equivalent weight equivalent weight can be found out by dividing the atomic weight by the n factor i'll just simply show you an example of this for example aluminium ion al3 plus if you take aluminium ion you know that its atomic weight is going to be 27 whereas its equivalent weight is going to be 27 divided by the cationic charge which is 3 that is equal to 9 all of you understood how to calculate the equivalent weight for example sodium na plus for na plus atomic weight and equivalent weight is the same because it is na plus is that clear to all so sometimes numerical may come based on the first law second law only the statement you need to remember the amount of different substances liberated by the same quantity of electricity passing through the electrolyte solution are proportional to their chemical equivalent weight that means you pass the same quantity of electrolyte sorry electricity through two substances then w1 by w2 that is mass of, mass of first substance deposited by mass of second substance is equal to e1 by e2 the ratio of their equivalent weights that is faraday's second law of electrolysis now another important topic related to theory question is the products of electrolysis see very simple rule if you have an electrolysis happening and you want to see what is going to form at the cathode and the anode just look at what are the ions who are participating for example molten nacl you take molten nacl means which all ions are there na plus and cl minus is there so there is only one cation and one anion so what will happen this cation will get reduced at the cathode so na plus plus electron will give you na and this chloride ion will get oxidized to form chlorine so 2 cl minus gives cl2 plus 2 electron so here in electrolysis when you want to predict the product just look at which all ions are there look at another example here aqueous nacl when you are electrolyzing tell me in aqueous nacl which all ions are present aqueous nacl you have Na plus ions of course and Cl minus ion and since it says aqueous what else do we have H plus ions and OH minus ions are also there yes or no now the question is there are two positive ions who will get deposited at the cathode simple answer the one who has the highest reduction potential the one who has the highest reduction potential will get deposited at the cathode is that clear if you compare sodium and hydrogen hydrogen has got more reduction potential so who will get deposited at the cathode hydrogen gas will be released at the cathode then compared to cl minus and oh minus you see remember in the anode the one who has the lowest reduction potential will be discharged but you know when it comes to oh minus there is a problem in case of OH minus, there is an extra over potential requirement for OH. So even though the value of reduction potential is lesser for OH compared to Cl, Cl will get discharged instead of OH minus because of the high requirement of over potential for OH minus. So I will tell you uh, one way to remember this. The discharge of negative ions, the order you can remember here, this is the order cl minus then only oh minus then only sulfate then only nitrate so if any competition comes in between these anions the order of discharge is this is that clear if you take dilute h2so4 dilute h2so4 means you have h plus ions you have oh minus ions you have sulfate ions so you can see here h plus there is only one cation so it will be deposited at the cathode and then oh minus ions and sulfate already if you know remember this order you can easily say oh minus so you can see that oxygen is liberated at anode hydrogen is liber liberated at cathode is it clear <laughs> see there are some products of electrolysis given in your textbook learn only that clear learn only those examples mainly 
otherwise if they give you uh, some other examples they will include the electrode potential values also and then they will ask you the question so in that case if you have two cations present who will you deposit at the cathode the one who has higher reduction potential and who will you deposit at the anode the one who has lower reduction potential but especially when it comes to hal uh, chloride and uh, oh just remember oh has less preference than chloride because of the uh, over potential requirement then commercial cells this is something that you need to by heart each cell what anode reaction what cathode reaction and the total overall reaction and also especially for lead acid battery please do learn what happens during recharging what happens during discharging very 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 important theory question now tell me an electrochemical cell behave like an electrolytic cell when this is actually from the first part of the electrochemistry chapter where you you might have seen they have set up uh, uh, different apparatus and they connected an external voltage and they have given you the condition like you connect an external battery to an electrochemical cell what will happen if the external battery's voltage is equal to e cell there will be no net movement of electrons now if you apply an external voltage which is higher than the cell voltage for example if you take a galvanic cell 1.1 volt is the cell voltage so if you apply something more than 1.1 volt what will happen the that cell will behave as an electrolytic cell and all the reactions will reverse so what is the condition here an electrochemical cell behaves like an electrolytic cell when e external is greater than e cell is that clear to all if it is less than e cell normal electrochemical cell reaction will have, have take place that means zinc will lose electron copper will gain electron but if you apply an extra external voltage which is higher copper will start losing and zinc will start gaining got it is it clear for all right give two points of differences between electrochemical and electrolytic cells in an electrochemical cell what is happening chemical energy of redox reaction is used to create electricity whereas electrolytic cell electrical energy is used to drive chemical reactions isn't it one is spontaneous one is non-spontaneous which one is spontaneous in electrochemical cell we have a spontaneous redox reaction happening where delta g is negative whereas in an electrolytic cell you are creating a non-spontaneous redox reaction to happen by using electricity clear for all okay look at this question calculate delta g naught for this reaction zinc plus copper uh, cu2 plus gives zn2 plus plus cu e0 value of zinc is given e0 value of copper is given r is given f is given first of all what is the relationship between delta g naught and e0 cell delta g naught is equal to minus nf e0 cell very simple equation free energy change is equal to minus nf e0 cell but we don't have e0 cell we, but we do know we don't know certain things about this reaction look at this reaction in this reaction how many electrons are involved number of electron involvement is two now e naught cell e naught cell can be calculated by the formula e naught cathode minus e naught anode yes or no how do i know who is cathode and who is anode you know the same basic principle what is that the one which has the higher reduction potential will be cathode so among copper and zinc who is going to be the cathode it will be copper so it will be 0 0.34 minus minus 0 0.76 so that will be 1.1 e naught now direct substitution only nothing else two electrons involved 96500 is faraday's constant and 1.1 volt and whatever answer you get here will be in joules if it is a very big value you convert it into kilojoules clear of course this will be a very big value so you write it in joules all of you understood delta g calculation from e0 cell yes right joules or kilojoules both are fine calculate the maximum work and log kc for the given reaction at 298 kelvin given e0 nickel 2 plus yeah electrode potentials are given what do you need to find maximum work 
maximum work means they are asking you how much is the free energy change that's it because what is the meaning of free energy the amount of energy available to do useful work so sometimes instead of asking calculate delta g naught they will ask you calculate the maximum work so just you need to find out what is the value of delta g naught direct formula delta g naught is equal to minus nf e naught cell again like in the previous question what is n value here there are two electrons involved then uh, f value is already given e0 cell e0 cell you can calculate this will be cathode this will be anode clear any doubt in this question related to the g0 delta g0 part whatever answer you get it will be negative so let's say you know if it is to uh, 20000 joules minus 20000 joules the answer for this question will be calculate the maximum work the maximum work is 20000 joules that's it did you understand that? Is it clear? Right. Now we need to find log Kc for the given reaction. What was the equation? What was the equation for Kc? E naught cell is equal to 0 0.0591 divided by n log Kc. This is the expression, isn't it? So here E naught cell you can find out N is already known to then directly find log KC. See, look at this question. In this question, no need to find what is KC. Anti-log is not given there. So they asked what is log KC. So just solve this and f write the answer as log KC is equal to this much. That's it. You don't need to take anti-log. The value is not given there. Is that clear? right okay calculate the emf of the following cell this is a nernst equation based question let me just tell you a few points about this in this when you, whenever you get a cell representation like this try to write the cell reaction so here zinc, zinc giving zinc 2 plus and ag plus reducing to ag uh, in case analog is given you have to write it in that order right so zn is the anode so zn plus ag plus gives zn2 plus plus ag this will be the cell reaction and you need to balance the uh, charges also 2 ag plus 2 ag this will be the complete overall reaction for this cell now what did they ask they asked what is the emf e cell is equal to e naught cell minus 0 0.0591 divided by n log of what is the expression for nernst equation come on everybody recollect what is the expression for nernst equation anode electrolyte concentration by cathode electrolyte concentration anode electrolyte concentration who is the anode electrolyte it is zn so zn2 plus concentration divided by cathode electrolyte is ag plus but do not forget to raise it with two why because this is the stoichiometric coefficient of this electrolyte so don't forget that clear that's why i wanted to show this part everybody please remember first you write the overall equation then you see how much is the stoichiometric coefficients if there are there is anything more than one please do raise that with the electrolyte concentration understood is it clear right then direct calculation what is find out what is e0 cell it's very easy everybody know how to find the cathode and anode who is the who is the cathode here it is silver who is the anode here it is zinc so e0 cell you can calculate the n is equal to 2 and directly find the answer clear right next one quickly assertion recent question conductivity of an electrolyte decrease with the decrease in concentration is that statement true or false conductivity of an electrolyte decreases with the decrease in the concentration is it true or false conductivity i told you conductivity decreases molar conductivity increases so assertion is true the reason given is number of ions per unit volume increases on dilution true or false
see i'm getting many answers as true and i'll tell you why you have written the true because the very moment i told you about the reason in the explanation many of you were thinking about that first part of the sentence number of ions per unit volume on dilution you know that middle factor the increases decreases that was not properly conveyed or that was not properly taken into your brain remember read this statement once again number of ions per unit volume it is going to decrease when you add water isn't it so it's a false statement so assertion is true but reason is incorrect have you all understood that so the take from this question is not the answer of this question the take from this question is presence of mind is very important when you write the exam is it clear so no matter how much you have prepared how confident are you don't become overconfident don't jump into conclusions read it again and again manage your time effectively and then answer is it clear you should not lose that one mark from 100 <laughs> Predict the products of electrolysis of an aqueous solution of copper chloride with platinum electrodes. Come on, quick. Products of electrolysis of aqueous solution of copper chloride with the platinum electrode. It's an inert electrode. So copper chloride solution. CuCl2. Cu2 plus ion will be there. Cl minus ion will be there. And it is solution. That means H plus will be there. OH minus will be there. Come on. Who will, who will deposit it at, at the cathode? Who will deposit at the cathode among the cations? You have it here. Look at this. What is the reduction potential of copper? Plus 0.34. What is the reduction potential of hydrogen? Zero. So who will deposit at the cathode? The one who has the highest reduction potential will deposit at the cathode. Isn't it? So who will deposit at the cathode? Cu2 plus accepts two electron to become Cu. And among the anions, who will deposit at the anode? Who will deposit? The one with the lowest reduction potential. Look here, guys. Chlorine's reduction potential is 1.36. Oxygen's reduction potential is 1.23. Who has lowest? As per the value, it is oxygen. But you remember I told you something about the chlorine and the chloride and the oxygen's problem. Oxygen has some additional over potential requirement. Because of that, it is not going to get deposited at the anode when chloride is there. So who will be there at the anode? Cl minus. Cl minus will undergo oxidation to form Cl. Is that clear to everyone? Is that clear? Right, very good. The next one. Electrical resistance of a column of 0 0.05 molar KOH solution of length of 50 cm and area of cross section 0 0.625 is 5 into 10 raised to 3. Calculate its resistivity, conductivity and molar conductivity. So many things we have to find here. But you know, everything is very easy. Concentration is given 0 0.05 molar. Length of the conductor is given 50 centimeter. Area of cross section is given 0 0.625 centimeter square. Resistance is given 5 into 10 raised to 3 ohms. Right? So, first things resistivity. What was the basic equation I told you? R equal to rho L by A. So, resistivity you can find as R A by L. So, direct substitution R is given, A is given, L is given. And your final answer will be in what unit? What is the unit of resistivity? What is the unit of resistivity? It will be ohm centimeter here in this case because area is given in centimeter square and length is given in again centimeter. So it will be in ohm centimeter whatever you are getting after calculation. Now conductivity we need to find easy. What is conductivity 1 by rho? Correct 1 by rho. And whatever value you get here, what will be the unit? I'm more concerned about the units. Come on, what is the unit here? The unit of conductivity, it's 1 by rho. 1 by rho means it's going to be ohm inverse, centimeter inverse. Ohm inverse is Siemens, 
per centimeter, right? That will be the unit of K. Yes, more centimeter inverse. That's also correct. Yeah. Then we have to find the molar conductivity. What is lambda m? K by C into 1000. K by C into 1000. So K is already found out. C is already here. 1000. And C is in moles per liter, right? So tell me the final answers unit. Come on. Final answers unit. About this also I told you to remember. Final unit. Siemens centimeter square mole inverse. Isn't it? Yes. How many coulombs are required to reduce one mole of Cr2O7 2 minus to Cr3 plus? Look here. Cr2O7 2 minus we need to reduce to Cr3 plus. We will just write the equation for this. Look at this. Here I have uh, 2 Cr3 plus. Okay. Then I have 7 oxygen. So I will add 7 H2O here. Clear? And then I will add 14 H plus in this side. Because this side there are 14 H. Now how many electrons? I need to add 6 electrons. So for 1 Cr O7 2 minus. How many electrons do I need? For 1, I need 6 electron. Correct? So for 1 mole, how much I need? I need 6 mole electron. What is the charge of 6 mole of electron? 6 Faraday. 6 Faraday. Because charge of 1 mole of electron is 1 Faraday. So I need 6 Faraday here. Is that clear to everyone? Everybody understood how did I find the number of electrons there? Just, just look at the change in the oxidation number. This is plus 6 to plus 3. So total 2 species are reducing. So it will be 6 electrons involved. Okay, good. Next one. Quick. X and Y are 2 electrolytes. On dilution, molar conductivity of X increases 2.5 times. While that of Y increases 25 times. Which of the two is a weak electrolyte and why? About this I told you. I told you in the... Uh, variation of conductivity. Come on, who will say the right answer? X and Y are two electrolytes. When I diluted it, on dilution, X conductivity increased only 2.5 times. And Y increased around 25 times. Who is a weak electrolyte? Come on, come on, comment your answer. Y is weak. Y is weak. Why is weak? Why why is weak? Because weak electrolytes on dilution they will have more degree of dissociation. So they will flourish more number of ions. But you know for a strong electrolyte the moment you put them in the solution they are almost dissociated. All what you do on dilution is you, you are just you are just decreasing the inter ionic forces of attraction. That's it. You don't have a remarkable increase in number of ions there for a strong electrolyte. So remember, if you see that the conductivity shoot up all of a sudden for an electrolyte on dilution, it will be a weak electrolyte. Whereas if you don't see much increase, then it will be a strong electrolyte. Is that clear? Right? The next one, calculate the mass of silver deposited at the cathode when current of 2 ampere was passed through a solution of AgNO3 for 15 minutes. Given molar mass of Ag is 108, 1 Faraday is equal to 96,500 coulomb. Okay, direct question. We need to find mass of silver deposited. Okay, current is given 2 ampere and it is passed through 15 minutes time is equal to 15 minutes see better take it in seconds so that will be 15 into 60 seconds now given molar mass of silver is 108 1 faraday is also given tell me which equation should i use i can directly go with the faraday's first law right z i t or i can also uh, i can write it also as z is equal to what e by f into i t I can also write E as what? A by N. Atomic mass of silver by N. Right? So for silver, silver you know AG. AG plus plus electron gives AG. This is the reaction. 
So, what is atomic mass? Atomic mass of silver is 108. Current passed is 2 ampere. Time is 15 into 60. Divided by N is 1 mole. Right? Into F is 96,500. Whatever answer you get here will be in grams. Because the molecular weight is taken in gram per mole. Right? Mass deposited is ZIT. Yes, that equation. Faraday's first law. All of you understood that? Have you understood the method? Right. Predict the products of electrolysis in each of the following. An aqueous solution of AgNO3 with platinum electrodes. Come on, quick. AgNO3 with the platinum electrodes. Aqueous solution of H2SO4 with platinum electrodes. Both of them. The predict the products. So in AgNO3 we have Ag plus ions and H plus ions. Then as the anions NO3 minus OH minus. Come on, easy now. At the cathode, who will who will go? At the anode, who will go? The one with the higher reduction potential, that is silver, right? So silver will be deposited at the cathode. The reaction will be Ag plus plus electron gives Ag. So this will be the cathode reaction. And among nitrate and OH minus, who will deposit? Come on. Nitrate and OH minus, I gave you a list to remember. Nitrate and OH minus, who will deposit there? At the anode. At the anode, OH minus will be deposited. I mean, OH minus will get discharged to release oxygen. Yes, good. An aqueous solution of H2SO4 with the platinum electrode. Aqueous solution of H2SO4 has H plus ions only as the cation. And then anion you have OH minus and sulfate. Come on, easy. At the cathode there is none other than hydrogen. So cathode you will have hydrogen released. And anode among these two who will go? OH minus. Is that clear to everyone? Right. Give two advantages of fuel cells. A very simple question, yet a very important one. What are fuel cells? In fuel cells, hydrogen and oxygen, the combustion is used to generate energy, right? What are the advantages? First thing is, it is the most efficient of all. Around 70% is the efficiency. And second thing is, it is eco-friendly, non-polluting, because all you get is the byproduct is water, right? In the Apollo space program, that same water was used for drinking by the astronauts. Next, using the E0 values of A and B, predict which is better for coating the surface of iron. Iron's potential is given. You are asked, among this and this, who is better to coat iron? See, the principle is very simple. If, we, if you are coating something with iron, then that something should get oxidized. That means it should be having more tendency to get oxidized, which means its reduction potential should be lesser than that of iron. Yes or no? Yes. So among minus 2.37 and 0.14, this is the one which has lesser reduction potential. Lesser reduction potential. Is that clear? Lesser reduction potential. So all of you understood that concept also. Clear, right? Okay. Now kinetics, a quick review we will do. So in kinetics, we have average rate and instantaneous rate expression. Then we have half-life integrated rate equation, the difference between molecularity and order. Very important theory question, the difference between molecularity and order. I'll, I'll explain while we do the questions, okay? Instead of focusing more on the theory now. Yeah, this table, this is something I want everybody to remember. It's a very, very important uh, table. Zero order reaction, the rate equation is, uh, rate is equal to K into A raised to zero. AT is equal to minus KT plus A0. This is the integrated rate equation. Half-life is A0 by 2K. 
then unit of rate constant the graph similarly for first order reaction also you have an integrated rate equation half life the unit of rate constant and the graph see please try to remember the integrated rate equation and its variations it's very easy you can easily draw the graphs based on that for example in a in a zero order reaction you can see the concentration of the reactant at any point of time is equal to minus kt plus the initial concentration this is the this is the equation for zero order reaction correct so if we draw a graph where the concentration of the reactant is taken on the y axis and time is taken on the x axis it will be a graph with a negative slope correct it will be a graph with negative slope so here this y intercept will be what it will be r0 that is the initial concentration and then what will be the slope of the graph it will be equal to minus k everybody know the basic equation y is equal to mx plus c kind of graph so m is the slope so here minus k is the slope and x coordinate is time and y coordinate is the concentration and r0 is the y intercept this is the variant variant variation of the graph of zero order reaction likewise for first order also we have different variants if you look through that with the question another important theory part pseudo order reaction pseudo first order reaction you all know what is the meaning of pseudo first order reaction example is more important please focus here acid hydrolysis of esters acid hydrolysis of cane sugar these two are best examples for pseudo first order reaction what is pseudo first order reaction a reaction that may look of a higher order but having a first order because one reactant's concentration is so high that its change in concentration is negligibly small so it won't it won't affect the rate of the reaction that's called pseudo first order reaction look at this if you take ethyl acetate and hydrolyze it with water in acidic medium you get acetic acid and ethanol this is the reaction in this there are two reactants one is ester one is water so normally when you write the rate equation how do you write r is equal to k into concentration of the ester into concentration of the water but in reality the water's amount is so high that it is not going to change much hence it can be taken as a constant so instead of writing this k into h2o you can write it as k dash into ester's concentration so it is dependent only on the concentration of the ester so that's why it is called as a pseudo first order reaction remember the examples okay cane sugar hydrolysis ester hydrolysis now next one is arrhenius equation very important equation this again you know you don't need so much of mathematical treatment of this a e raised to minus ea by rt in this equation the basic things are k is the rate constant a is arrhenius factor e raised to minus ea by rt this is equal to the fraction of molecules which have the energy greater than or equal to the activation energy and uh, here uh, if you take the logarithm there is a graph as well log k is equal to log a minus ea by 2.303 rt similar to the previous graph i showed you with a negative slope and then uh, there is yet another graph related to the activation energy sometimes sometimes you may get a numer you may get a uh, question based on that for example a giving b it has an energy barrier to cross to reach b so here in this graph there are few things you need to remember first of all what is the energy required for a to reach this transition state how much is it that energy is called as activation energy now a already has some inherent energy so the total energy that a required to reach the activation state this is called as threshold energy okay threshold energy now how much a originally has that is called as the average kinetic energy so that's why i have written the formula here everybody notice activation energy is equal to threshold energy minus average energy of the reacting molecules is that clear is that clear now another thing is another equation is variation of the uh, rate constants with temperature log k2 by k1 is equal to ea by 2.303 r t2 minus t1 by t1 t2 in based on this formula last three four years there were no numerical questions so it's not that important to focus and finally the collision theory equation that is important the theory part only the rate of a reaction is equal to p into z a b 
e raised to minus e a by rt p is the probability factor or the steric factor which accounts for are the collisions happening with a proper uh, 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 orientation that is called p and then z is the collision frequency that is how many how many collisions are happening per second per unit volume of the reaction mixture these were the theories now quickly tell me the questions in the given reaction a plus 3b give, giving 2c the rate of formation of c is 2.500 and raised to minus 4 calculate the rate of the reaction and rate of disappearance of b let me tell you this is a very important question one of the most expected question and one question which you may make wrong because of a careless mistake okay so let's see what is the mistake that is going to happen a plus 3b giving 2c look at this reaction in this reaction if i write the rate of this reaction it can be written as minus d by dt of concentration of a which is equal to minus 1 by 3 d by dt of concentration of b which is equal to 1 by 2 d by dt of concentration of c this is how the rate equation is written right yes now please do read this as a sentence i want you to read this as a sentence this mathematical expression rate of the reaction is equal to rate of depletion of a minus one by third rate of disappearance of b which is equal to half of rate of appearance of c that's how you read it right that's how you read it now what did they give in the question rate of formation of c is this much what is the meaning of that d by dt of c is equal to 2.5 into 10 raised to minus 4 correct moles per liter per second yeah now calculate the rate of the reaction how is rate related to uh, c how is rate related to c r is equal to what half of dc by dt correct half of dc by dt half of dc by or d by dt of c therefore what will be the rate it will be half of 2.5 into 10 raised to minus 4 that will be 1.25 into 10 raised to minus 4 moles per liter per second moles per liter per second now second part of the question is what is the rate of disappearance of b what is the rate of disappearance of b what are they asking here minus d by dt of b is equal to how much right I can relate it with the rate itself I just found out rate in the previous question right so I can relate it this whole thing is equal to rate correct so what will be d by dt of b it will be three times the rate yes or no it is three times because this into three is what is this correct it is three times the rate so that will be three into 1.25 into 10 raised to minus 4 3.75 into 10 raised to minus 4 mole per liter per second is that clear to all did you understand this don't make a mistake in this question clear read the question clearly whatever whatever you have given or you whatever is there in that uh, question whatever you are writing mathematically read it as a statement then it makes sense like you know formation of c that means d by dt of c is what is given then relate it with the equation what you have written is that clear to all okay let's 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 look at the assertion reason question one of them molecularity of the reaction h2 plus b2 br2 is giving 2 hbr appears to be 2 is that true is that true quick 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 Molecularity of the reaction H2 plus Br2 gives 2 HPR appears to be 2. What is molecularity? The number of moles of reactant species involved in an elementary reaction is called as molecularity. There is one mole of H2, there is one mole of Br2. So the molecularity is 2 only. It is correct. The reason given two molecules of the reactants are involved in the given elementary reaction. That is indeed true and it is a dependent statement, right? So assertion and reason are both correct what do you understand by the order of the reaction see one of the definition 
that you can expect is order what is order order of a reaction is the sum of the powers of the coefficients of the uh, concentration of the reactants in the rate equation or the rate law that is called as order identify the reactions order from each of the following units look at this there is an easy way to re remember the order of the reaction or you can identify the order of the reaction by taking the power of l and add one very easy taking the power of l and add one to it let's do it here in the first case what is the order what is the power of l here minus one add one it will be zero order easy and then look at this one what is the order of what is the power of l here it is one right so one plus one which is two see how easy is that if there is no l at all like yeah look at the next question if the rate constant is k is equal to 3 into 10 raised to minus 4 s raised to minus 1 then identify the order what is the power of l here l is 0 so 0 plus 1 is 1 first order see how easy is that did you did you understand that no need to write this in the answer okay it's just a tip to remember right look at the next question for a reaction h2o2 giving h2o plus o2 the proposed mechanism is given first step second step write the rate law of the reaction remember if there are, there is a complex reaction which involves multiple steps the rate law can be written based on the rate determining step which is the rate determining step the slowest step so the rate expression can be written as r is equal to k into H2O2 concentration into I minus concentration because lowest step is the rate determining step. Write the overall order of the reaction. How do you find the overall order? Just add this and this, right? The overall order will be equal to 1 plus 1, which is 2. Now, out of steps 1 and 2, which is the rate determining step? Who will be the rate determining step always? RDS will be step 1. Why step 1? because if you have a reaction which can be divided into uh, individual uh, steps the slowest one will be the one who decides what should be the speed of the reaction is it clear right a reaction is second order in a and first order in b immediately when you get such kind of questions immediately write the reactions rate law r is equal to k into second order with respect to a and first order with respect to b a raised to 2 into b raised to 1 done uh, Dhruvil, uh, why is the slow reaction rate determining see it's a very simple logic if you have a 4 into 100 meter relay the winning chance of that relay is based on the slowest runner that's that's the simple logic that you can think of why the slowest step is the rate determining step yes or no right so write the differential rate equation so differential rate equation dx by dt is equal to k into a raised to 2 into b raised to 1 so that is the first part of the question second part how is the rate affected on increasing the concentration of a three times very easy look at this let this be first equation so dx by dt the rate is equal to k into they are saying three times you increase the rate concentration of a so it will become 3a square into b so that will become 9 times k into a square into b now what is a square into b what is k into a square into b that is the old rate correct this is the old rate this is the new rate so r dash is equal to 9 times r is that clear to everyone is that clear to everyone yes how is the rate affected when the concentration of both a and b are doubled when the rate how is the rate affected when the concentration of both a and b are doubled look at this again let's make a new equation r double dash is equal to k into how are we doing it we are doubling both a and b isn't it so 2 times a square into 2 times b so overall it will become 4 into 2 8 8 into k into a square into b correct that will become 8 times the old rate did you understand this 
Yes, good. In all these three chapters, it should be full marks. Very, very, very easy chapters. Hydrolysis of an ester follows first order kinetics. Is it true? I told you two examples. Ester hydrolysis is pseudo first order and also cane sugar hydrolysis is pseudo first order. So this is true. The concentration of water remains nearly constant during the course of the reaction. Yes, that's why it is a pseudo first order reaction because the amount of water is so high compared to the concentration of the ester that the concentration change in ester only affects the rate of the reaction but not water. Clear? Okay. For a chemical reaction, predict the order of the reaction. Come on, look at the graph. Look at the coordinates. It's R versus T. Which order is this? R versus T. Come on. Concentration of R versus T. Yes, it is zero order. Very good. What is the slope of the curve? That is very easy. You, you guys remember the reaction. What? Uh, sorry, the integrated rate equation. What was that? R is equal to minus kt plus r0 so this is y is equal to mx plus c so what is the slope here the slope is minus k good minus k so by just simply looking at the coordinates of the y-axis you can understand which uh, graph is it is it zero order or first order next for a first order reaction, show that the time required for 99% completion is twice the time required for the completion of 90% of the reaction. In the past 10 years, this would be the most frequently repeatedly asked question related to kinetics. Very easy question. For a first order reaction, tell me what is the equation for the integrated rate equation for the first order reaction for the rate constant. K is equal to 2.303 divided by T log of R naught by R. Correct? This is the this is the equation. The, this is the integrated rate equation for the rate constant, right? So what are they asking? Time required for 99 percentage. How can I write an expression? It will be 2.303 divided by k log of. Let me take initial concentration 100. 99 percent completion means what? How much is remaining? 1 percent is remaining. So 100 by 1. And what will be 90 percent completion? 90% will be 2.303 by k log of 100 divided by 90% is completed means remaining is 10. Yeah. So this will become T99 is 2.303 by k log of 100. Log of 100 is log of 10 square. So that will be 2 log 10. Correct. So I can write 2 log 10. Now this is log 10, right? See, very very clear. What is 2.303 by k into log 10? It is T90. Therefore, T99 percentage is equal to 2 times T90. Clear? See, please do write it in the proper steps, okay? Not like the way how I'm writing here. I'm just quickly showing you what are the substitutions to be done. Is it clear? Please craft the steps very neatly and step by step you write and present the answer okay yeah it is twice write the slope value obtained in the plot of l and r versus time for a first order reaction tell me first order reaction integrated rate equation come on quick l and r is equal to minus kt plus l and r zero what are they plotting l and r versus time so this is y coordinate this is a time is going to be x coordinate so this will be m and this will be c correct so what is the slope again slope is equal to minus k focus here if it is logarithm to the base e this is the situation but you know sometimes it might be logarithm to the base 10 so in that case how will this equation change it will be kt by 2.303 plus log r0 that is the equation so if i plot log r like this it will be mx plus c equation here who is the slope or what is the slope it will be minus 2.303 did you understand that the value of the slope depends on is it natural logarithm or common common logarithm understood okay great another possibility is there okay 
don't don't forget that as well see uh, I can I can also write this as this equation okay I'm talking about this equation everybody please focus sometimes you will get a graph like this log r is equal to minus kt by 2.303 I can write kt by 2.303 is equal to log r naught minus log r so what is log r naught minus log r it will become log r naught divided by r which is equal to what will it become kt by 2.303 if i am taking a y coordinate like this and x as t then it will be k by 2.303 but the shape of the graph will be straight line with a positive slope all of you understood that all of you understood that the graph will be having a it will be a straight line with a positive slope because it is log r naught by r versus time clear so all the variance of the graphs see there is nothing you need to buy hard here everything is crystal clear in front of you once you clearly get that idea like starting with the very basic integrated rate equation that's enough you can derive then and there itself right half-life period for a zero order reaction is equal to come on kuk 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 half-life period for a zero order reaction zero order reaction zero order reaction what is t half it will be equal to r naught by 2k correct for zero order reaction what is the equation for first order reaction first order reaction is independent of initial concentration 0.693 by k these are the only two half-life equations you need to remember very easy numericals may come based on the first order half-life okay look at this one rate constant for a first order reaction has been found to be this much calculate its three-fourth life calculate its three-fourth life what is three-fourth life means 75 percentage completion correct 75 percentage completion so <coughs> excuse me so rate constant is given <coughs> you need to find the three-fourth life t34 is equal to 2.303 divided by k log of r naught by r so already they have given k 2.54 into 10 raised to minus 3 into log of what is r naught see it is 75 percent completion so let's take it as 100 divided by 75 percent completed means 25 is remaining yes 25 is remaining so 100 by 25 is 4 log of 4 already they have given the value solve this and the answer will be in seconds okay just look at the rate constants unit depending on that your final answer unit will be seconds or minutes or hour is that clear is that clear kids any doubts any doubts no quickly tell me what is the order of this reaction order order of the reaction yes it is first order look at the coordinate the coordinate is log r so it should be first order what is the slope of the curve slope of the curve slope of the curve yes very good minus k write the unit of the rate constant it is first order first order is unit what is the unit of rate constant second inverse isn't it second inverse now no problem even if you forget it also it's fine immediately in the answer sheet just write like this r equal to k into a raised to one this is first order right so you forgot what is the rate constant unit so you can derive it there itself a raised to one what is rate rate is mole per liter per second what is concentration mole per liter mole per liter mole per liter gets cancelled so what is k's unit 
second inverse. Sometimes, yeah, it happens that we may forget, but this very basic things, if it is there in your mind, you can derive it then and there and do it. Is that clear to all? Next, the rate constant of the first order decomposition is given. K is equal to this, calculate Ea and also the half-life period. Okay, we have only two more questions, so please listen carefully. K is equal to 2.5 into 10 raised to 14, E raised to minus 25,000 divided by T. See, doesn't it look like Arrhenius equation? What is Arrhenius equation? K is equal to A, E raised to minus Ea by RT. So tell me, how do I find Ea from this? Very easy. Minus this, this 25,000 is actually Ea by R. Yes or no? No, you don't have to take log also. Just look at it. Just compare the two equations. That 25,000, what is there here, this is same as Ea by R. So don't you think I can write Ea by R is equal to 25,000? So what is Ea? 25,000 into R. So that will be 25,000 into 8.314. Why 8.314? Because it's an energy equation. It's an energy equation. So it is joule per Kelvin per mole and your final answer will be in joules. If it is a very big value, don't hesitate to write it in kilojoules. Clear? And you need to find the <coughs> half-life period. Okay, rate constant if it's half-life is 300. Very easy. You know it's a first order reaction. T half is equal to 0 0.693 by K. So you can find the rate constant as 0.693 divided by 300 and your final answer will be in minute inverse because you have taken 300 minutes. Is that clear? Any doubts? Everybody understood this problem? Okay, great. Next one. See, this is the question I told you about the temperature dependency of the uh, uh, reactions. Like, you know, the rate of the reaction becomes four times when the temperature changes from 293 to 313. Calculate energy of activation. See, our equation was this. Log K2 by K1 is equal to Ea by 2.303 R into 1 by T1 minus 1 by T2. This is a direct equation. Just substitute it. That's it. What did they say? Rate of a reaction becomes 4 times. Which means K2 by K1 is equal to what? 4. Which is equal to Ea divided by 2.303 into R is 8.314 into 1 by T1. What is T1? The first temperature. 293 Kelvin minus 1 by the second temperature. 313. Now solve for Ea, it is an energy, so your final answer will be in joules, again if it's big, convert it into kilojoules. Have you all understood this clearly? The, this particular equation based numerical has not been asked much in the last uh, or in the recent years so don't worry about it but please do remember that equation okay in case if it comes <sighs> any doubts solutions electrochemistry chemical kinetics so we have discussed if even if it is not complete but still it has two complex calculation yeah see that might be one reason why they are not asking it uh, too much Anyway, so these three chapters are having numerical and theory questions. So you can score full marks in this. So organic chemistry module you have done yesterday. Today physical chemistry. Tomorrow we'll have inorganic chemistry. So uh, by this all should be feeling very confident and be ready for the uh, examination. So before I leave, I just want to 
tell you a very 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 important point like majority of you might have become serious very recently and you have started preparing and you are working really hard day and night and you are studying you are revising see slowly your confidence levels have all gone up but of course you know as a uh, compared to a student who has been uh, preparing right from the beginning the confidence level what you have might be a little lesser i'm not generalizing this but yes at least some of you will be there so this is for those who are tensed see there is no need to have any tension or stress because first of all whenever you have a stress or a tension see majority of you might be biology students so i don't have to tell you the biochemistry of what is happening there we have our amygdala which will activate your hypothalamus which will in turn signal your pituitary gland and that will activate the adrenal glands to release adrenal hormones mainly adrenaline rush will happen and even cortisone release will happen so if it happens during the exam it's going to be a problem for you because it's not going to help you to recollect what you have learned and what is the outcome you are not going you will not be able to perform as much as you have expected so you know that the outcome of having a tension or a fear for the exam is not going to do any good to you but instead think like this have i given my best will i be having any regrets in the future about this no you should not let that happen the only thing that we will have or that will haunt us will be the regrets about not acting in the situation so every one of you have still you know we have time to quickly revise and go through the theory and do the materials worksheets which we have given you which your teachers uh, have helped you to figure out everything is there with you just stay confident don't let your adrenaline rush or cortisone rush spoil your mood just go to the exam hall with 100% confidence and be sincere and honest to yourself you aspire for you know you think of you guys standing you know as a professional after 10 years or uh, 12 years standing as a doctor wearing an apron or a, or ending up in a uh, corporate company where you want to work your dream job so think positive stay positive and no need to have any stress because st stress is going to make your exams bad so do not let stress take over your mind feel very free feel very confident just do your work sincerely in these remaining days and appear for the exam confidently and you will come up with great results and this is this is the belief that we teachers have on you so remember that everybody have faith in you so the first thing that you have to have is the self faith so have faith in yourself go for the examination with full confidence and you will get really good results so i'm not taking much of your time we will see with another session of inorganic chemistry tomorrow until then this is danish venugopal signing off bye good night brilliant kata your trusted coaching partner for iit je neat science and commerce students with 10 years of excellence in quality training brilliant kata